My name's Dave DeBow, founder of MoneyPartnerFormula.com, and this show is built for everyday real estate investors who are actively doing deals and looking to scale using other people's money. So if you're an active real estate investor and you want to get featured on this show to talk about your own real estate and capital raising experiences, then just go to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now let's get rolling with this episode and remember to subscribe for daily interview content. Welcome back, folks. Hey, if you've been paying any attention to the real estate world for the last few years, you've seen that there's been kind of a seismic shift when it comes to multifamily investing. I mean, it was go, go, go for a whole bunch of years. And then things change with, with the prices of properties and then <laughs> the price of money. And things have kind of shifted in the multifamily space. And sometimes multifamily investors are now starting to pivot over to other asset classes. And I've got a very experienced real estate entrepreneur and capital raiser and entrepreneur in general, David Hansel, zooming in from the Garden State of New Jersey. And we're going to be talking a little bit about that. So David, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me on. Look forward to it. So David, why don't you give us, to start with, a big picture overview, a snapshot, if you will, of what does your active real estate investing business look like today, mid-2024? Sure. So the active investment real estate is our equity company, Lucerne Capital, which mm -hmm. differentiates from our debt company called Alpha Funding. In that business, um, we historically have been investing in value-add multifamily projects. Um, we've done some land development and other things of that nature. And there was certainly a, a great run-up over the last you know, eight to 10 years in that space. And, you know, as markets change, you have to be able to change strategies and, and look for opportunities where, you know, ahead of the crowd. And uh, so we've kind of pivoted over the last two years and put a lot of energy and focus into what's referred to as flex warehouse or small bay industrial. So why don't you tell us a little bit about flex warehouse and, and small bay and industrial and what are the pros and cons that you've seen with that versus traditional multifamily? Sure. So when people hear industrial, sometimes they think of these massive cold storage logistic centers for Amazon or Walmart or whatever that may be, you know, your 300 to million square foot space. The small bay uh, flex warehouse is kind of like that typical industrial park you drive through and you see a whole bunch of names on the sign. There may be 20 tenants, 10 tenants in the building. Um, generally, these, these properties are 100,000 square feet or less. Kind of the sweet spot is around 50,000 square feet. It's multi-tenanted, um, which kind of, in a way, is similar but different to multifamily, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you have leases that range from one year to three years. So you can mark to market as leases roll off. Um, what we're finding is that there's a lot of older ownership in the small bay, like family owned, operated, kind of what we saw in multi like 10 years, eight, 10 years ago, um, where there's really opportunity to improve and, and uh, you know, bring some institutional inv investment and management to these assets to increase rents um, and, and move that along. So there's some similarities in that where it creates some hedge against inflation, although the talk now is less about inflation and maybe more about recession. Um, but, you know, this asset class is very underserved um, and it's growing. Like we're looking at a project right now in, um, in Maryland and, you know, there's about 3% of all the land is zoned for com small, uh, for commercial uh, industrial space. And, you know, there's nowhere for these folks to go. You, your typical tenants are trades, um, printing, small logistics, um, you know, sometimes some small manufacturing and the uh, alike. So there's um, similarities on the front of the, the duration and the ability to mark to market. Mm -hmm. um, you have multi-tenant, so you have some diversity, but where it differs is, you know, you're you're obviously looking at a commercial tenant that rather than someone that's using it for their home. But the ratio of their rent to their revenue 
is far less than what a tenant pays as a ratio of their income to what they're paying for rent. So I feel that from a risk perspective, you know, you can can hedge that a bit more than you can on the multi side. Yeah. So the the tenant profile completely different and a lot lower likelihood that they're going to skip out on paying the rent because their livelihood depends on it. And Correct. That's their, you know, otherwise their company is going out of business. A lot of these spaces could be 2000 square feet, you know, two to 5,000, 10,000 is a pretty large size for, for the small Bay industrial. Um, so, you know, it's not a, a lot of dollars and it's a necessity for operations. Yeah. Very good. Now, do you also do, triple net leases or are these just regular type leases? So good question. Um, we have tried and have been successful at transitioning our tenant base to triple net. Usually we're buying something where there may be some tenants that are already triple net leased or modified net leases in the, in the property. Um, and we'll seek to move that before we even move rents up. So like if we come in and rents are, you know, $8 a foot, but markets at 11, we may say, look, we're going to pass on all the expenses to you as a triple net lease. And we'll, we'll move the rents up a dollar, which yeah. is a really good compromise because they don't have other options in the market. Right. Because mm -hmm. there's such low uh, vacancy um, and you're still below that market. But we, we try to do that because, you know, for all those people in the multi-space who have suffered the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that have gone on, like insurance costs that's gone through the roof, yeah. um, those are costs that you can't, you really can't do anything about. So you have that flexibility in industrial to pass that on to the tenant. And that that's a great hedge against risk for you. Yeah, well, that makes a lot of sense. Very, very cool. So is that your primary thing that you're focusing on these days? So we've got the, uh, so you you mentioned two different classes. So you've got kind of the, the bays, the mixed use thing that you're talking about. What was the other one that you mentioned at the top of the call? Um, well, I was saying that we have in, we have multifamily and industrial assets, but we're, well, I thought there were two kinds of industrial assets that you had. Uh, Oh no no no! We're we're focused primarily on this sm small bay. Some of it is um, out like industrial outdoor storage IOS, okay. which yeah. is um, very attractive. Like we had a an asset we bought. It was a, a conglomeration of four buildings, and one of the buildings was a truck terminal uh, that had a lot of additional outdoor storage. And that's a very hot space right now. It's hard to come by. So like people needing to store materials and trucks and things out there. Um, so we, we were able to quickly flip this one building that was part of the portfolio, um, you know, for a really high premium. So we're, you know, we're looking at properties where we can create more outdoor storage space. Maybe there's additional land that we can clear and, and blacktop and then use that um, for, for additional storage. Very, very interesting. So David, you've been, you've raised a ton of capital over the years. You've got a whole business around lending and, and hard money lending and, and all that kind of good stuff. Let's focus on um, Lucerne Capital because you've, you've made the switch from focusing primarily on multifamily in the past now you're getting into the whole light industrial side of things. Has there been any challenge or a transition bringing your investors along with you for that ride? Um, not so much in transitioning from there. I, I could say my most of our investors started with us on the lending company, and a lot of them still have capital with us today. So we started that company in 07 and we're making loans and then we'd syndicate out the loan and like fractionalize it and investors could participate, which pays a high dividend, almost like a bank account, right? Tied to the real estate. So the yields were very high. The cash yields when we first started were, you know, d low double digits, which, you know, is, is extremely attractive. Um, but we transitioned into the equity side, which was the multi and some industrial, but now industrial. And that transition 
was actually probably more challenging than it was from multi to industrial, just because um, it was a whole new, a whole yeah, new. Because track. now they're not getting a fixed return; they're getting right. a variable return depending on the performance of the property. They're 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 owners versus just lenders, kind of thing. Would, Correct. Would that be kind of and, unfair. Yeah, absolutely, and. I think as a lot of them, we took a lot of time to educate them and talk about the risks and rewards. Then they kind of got it. Obviously, in ownership, you know, you have debt in front of you, so you, you're taking on equity risk. But with that, you get to depreciate the assets. You get a K-1 instead of a 1099, um, which allows for tax advantage, uh, tax advantage investments. Um, and then obviously, you can create value. Uh, and you can ride the market. Unfortunately, you know, markets change. They go up a lot, but they also come down. And so sometimes there's there's some of that where the lending has a lot less risk to it because you're behind the equity. So that transition was a little more difficult um, rather than going from multi to, to industrial. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would imagine that would be pretty big. So with with your your company alpha funding do i understand that basically you fund lots of people plus you you help fund your other deals that you do through lucerne capital is is that or is yeah, it completely so separate completely separate mm -hmm. alpha is set up to finance builders rehab like people that do fix and flip ground up construction dscr loans um We've been doing that, like I said, since 2007. We have an amazing team and process, great capital. Um, and, you know, the stuff that we do on Lucerne is larger commercial assets. So the capital that we have set up for Alpha is not viable for the, yeah. the projects that Lucerne does. But we're very active in the real estate investment market and, you know, still very active today with Alpha. Um, it, it kind of gives you a really good idea of all the good, the bad and ugly that happens in real estate. When you're looking at thousands of deals and yeah. you're watching people move through projects, some of the problems that they run into or challenges that they have, you know, you, you get a lot of education in, in, in that. So, <laughs> yeah, I would imagine for sure, David. So, so basically what you're talking about before is you've gotten some of your investors who were with alpha now investing with you, as equity partners in in Lucerne, is that what you're talking about the the education Correct. thing going on there? Yeah, yeah, and we continue to grow um, on both sides, investors all the time. Yeah. You know, folks that are looking to deploy money into the strategies that we're doing, be it on the lending side for Alpha or on the um, the equity side for Lucerne. Yeah. So you've been in the whole capital raising side of things for a long time, David. So. Knowing what you know now, if you were starting over again, kind of from scratch or advising somebody that's, you know, perhaps done a few deals and self-financed, and now they're looking to start bringing on joint venture partners or raising capital, what might be a tip or two you would have for somebody who's who's just getting started on that path? Sure. So obviously presentation is important. And when I talk about presentation, it's not just about how you present yourself as a human being and talk, you, you you obviously need to connect with them, listen to what they want, be upfront about the risks and the rewards, talk about the challenges that you've had, be, you know, you know, be real and be human about it. And then, you know, you also want to make sure that you talk to them about why you're going into the project, what, the business plan is what the alternative options for an exit are if 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 you run into a problem and it's really giving them that info so like over time we built you know very in-depth decks to talk about the investments you know if you're starting out at least you know put together some information about the market that you're investing in mm -hmm. why you like the project what the returns look like and what the the splits between you and them will will be, but it's about patience, and it it takes a long time to build the rapport and the relationship um, 
you know, to take on the responsibility of investing someone's capital for them. Most definitely. So what over the years have you found as being some best practices for you guys for following up with prospective investors? Because like you say, most people aren't going to cut you a check for a hundred grand after the first meeting. You have to kind of keep in touch with them. What have you guys found that works best for you in that? So we put a lot of effort into thought leadership and being present on social media, but not in in a an email blast and um, stay. It's you know like anything from a sales perspective, you have to touch them, you have to be in front of them, they have to see your name, they have to see you as a thought leader, and that can be hard in the beginning, right? You can only create so much or whatever background, but like we put a lot of effort into you know doing blogs and write-ups in industry magazines like my partner just got published in globe street um yesterday which was which was really great um and you know it's about constantly letting people know that this is what you do and why you're doing it and and the opportunities that exist in the space and if they want to participate that they can learn more about it through through a conversation with you. That makes a lot of sense. Well, David, if people would like to connect with you and find out more about what you're up to, uh, you've got multiple different things that you do, but what would be the the number one place for people to go? The number one, can I give two? Sure. (laughs) So LinkedIn, you can uh, connect with me on LinkedIn through David Hansel and, and message me that way. That's a very easy way. If you prefer to, to shoot an email, um, you can email me at david.hansel, H-A-N-S-E-L, at lucerne, L-U-C-E-R-N, capital.com. That's david.hansel at lucernecapital.com. Fantastic. Well, David, thank you very much for your insights. It's been great. Thank you, and I appreciate you having me on. All right, everybody, take care, and we'll see you on the next episode. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed that episode. And as always, if you want to listen to more daily interview content, make sure you subscribe. And if you're an active real estate investor and you're doing deals and you'd like to get featured on this show, then just head over to DaveInterviewsYou.com. Now at MoneyPartnerFormula.com, we help real estate investors to create a process for predictably getting capital so they can do more deals without relying on hard money lenders or the banks. We do this by building them a private capital marketing system. Now, if you want help turning yourself into a big money capital attraction machine, then book a call with our team to see how we can help. Just visit moneypartnerformula.com to find out more. All right, take care and we'll see you on the next interview.